Good morning, everyone. Day two of our Live Theology in Asian America conference is starting soon. I'm going to give a couple seconds for people to join the session. People are trickling in. We'll give them a couple seconds here. Good morning, James. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, Darren. I see the chats. People can familiarize themselves. Hi, Amy. Good morning to you. <clears throat> Hi, Beth. Good morning. Hi, Brian. It's good seeing you. And Isaac, good morning. <clears throat> Neil, James, Deborah. All right, Tom. Filling up fast, Macy, Carrie, hello. Reverend Kwong, hello. Fantastic. And we have the West Coast represented. That's commitment. That's great commitment. Fantastic. Let me begin with my opening remarks. Welcome back to day two of the 2021 Asian American Theology Conference titled Live Theology in Asian America, Race, Justice, and Politics in Trans-Pacific Context. For those who are joining us for the first time, my name is Dr. David Chow. I'm the director of the Asian American program at Princeton Theological Seminary. A big thank you to my steering committee, Bonnie Lin, Darren Yao, and John Huang for making yesterday a smooth and seamless experience. I think everyone is getting the hang for how AirMeet works. I will review the logistics at the end of my opening remarks. A big thank you to the audience and speakers for making day one a, a success. There was fantastic participation from the audience through the use of the chat function, as well as with the question and answer feed. Many of us were feeling the Holy Spirit when our speakers would go into preacher mode. Please continue to encourage our speakers with the emojis. This is an academic conference on Asian American theology. I understand theology to be critical reflection upon the church's beliefs and practices. As an academic conference on Asian American theology, we seek to offer critical reflection upon the beliefs and practices of the Asian American church broadly understood, especially within the 2020 context of the pandemic, our country's racial reckoning, and the presidential election. At the same time, this conference has practical aims. We seek to build up the church and its leaders with knowledge, skills, and resources to empower the pursuit of racial justice, especially by and for Asian Americans. And as people of faith, we believe that Christian theology has something unique to say about this. Jonathan Tran poignantly discussed how if we do not have a vision for justice that is part of God's creation and who God is, we cannot lean into our anti-racist work in a sustainable manner. A Christian theology of justice is what we need to offer the church and the world in the pursuit of anti-racism in all its forms. Yesterday, we began our Asian American Theology Conference with sociology and history so that we can broadly frame our discussion today of particular Asian and Asian American faith communities. Yesterday, we examined broader trends concerning the invisibility of Asian Americans within specific fields of study and discourses, including the invisibility of Asian Americans in anti-racist discourse. We discussed the fluidity and contingency of the term Asian American, and the need to always ground our use of the term Asian American in particular contexts. It is better to examine what actual Asian Americans do in particular contexts than to describe the group according to a set of cultural traits. As the historians so helpfully model in their work, it is important to always attend to context. That broader historical, sociological, and political framework is the perfect setup 
for this morning's presentations. This morning, we are going to hear the terms ethnography and lived theology. So I will give some preliminary definitions. Ethnography is a particular method for doing field work involving the observation and description of a particular group of people. Ethnography has its origins in anthropology and literally means from the Greek, writing about a people. In the last 10 to 15 years, it has been advanced as a productive method for doing Christian theology and ethics, as well as the study of world Christianity. In 2019, the World Christianity Conference at Princeton Theological Seminary focused on ethnographic methods. Lived theology is the theology implicit in the ordinary lives of Christians. Lived theology is faith in action. One of the problems in talking about Asian American identity is the risk of essentializing a group of people. To essentialize a group of people is to say something like, Asian Americans are a quiet group. Asian Americans are politically apathetic. Asian Americans are Confucian and respect their elders. While each of these traits may be true for some who are Asian American, they are not true for all in the group. Exceptions abound. Moreover, boiling a group down to some set of essential traits, such as being quiet, politically apathetic, or Confucian, can easily turn into stereotypes if these traits are negative. One of the arguments emerging from yesterday's presentations and discussions is that Asian American identity is always context specific. If we are going to generalize, we should generalize in ways that allow maximum diversity in the category since Asian American identity as it emerged from the late 1960s was a pragmatic and political term. When we say that Asian American identity is not a natural category, but a pragmatic and political category, we are saying, there is no Asian American language. There is no Asian American food or cuisine. There is no place in Asia from which Asian Americans originate. Rather, Asian American is an artificial category created for pragmatic and political purposes of building solidarity across a wide variety of Asian ethnic groups, including East Asian, South Asian, and Southeast Asians, and across a diversity of racial categories is captured in the photo Dr. Jane Hong showed of the Black, Latinx, Native, and Asian American student leaders of the Third World Liberation Front in Berkeley, California. In my courses on Asian American theology, I explain Asian American identity with reference to a history of immigration and racialization, which includes discussions of political economy. Moreover, to frame our understanding of how capital flows across nation state boundaries and is now global, we should think of political economy in transnational terms. When thinking of Asian American identity, we should think in terms of migration from Asia to the US. I find it helpful to highlight political economy as the driving force and explanatory cause for these migration patterns. Whatever Asian American identity is, it is less descriptively helpful to turn to culture and more helpful to turn to material histories of political economy. This is one strategy to avoid essentializing Asian American identity. But one can discuss political economies in broad sweeping and abstract ways. If we are to highlight human agency and the agency of particular communities, we should also have inductive studies that begin with what particular communities are doing in particular social circumstances. I call this a social practical orientation to the study of religion and theology. This is what ethnography, oral history, and fieldwork in general help us accomplish. I have framed day two of our Asian American Theology Conference through featuring four scholars who employ ethnography for theological ends. Each presentation will focus inductively on a particular group of people for theological ends. Easton Law's research is on Protestant Christianity in China, and his presentation will examine his social location as a Chinese American studying Christianity in China. Jillian Chu will analyze the Hong Kong church context in relation to the umbrella movement. Geoman George focuses on an Indian American Christian community in New York City and the Black Lives Matter movement. 
Jonathan Tran, will report his findings after doing field work with an Asian American Christian community in the San Francisco area. A significant benefit of these inductive approaches to doing Asian American theology is that they do not essentialize Asian American identity. There is no prior assumption of what Asians and Asian Americans must be. Rather, the fieldwork fills out the meaning of what it is to be Asian or Asian American. A word about the transpacific context of Asian American identity. The structure of this morning's papers is designed to highlight the transpacific context of Asian American identity. We have two speakers who focus on Asia and two speakers who focus on Asian America. Of course, one could focus on Asia without reference to Asian America, and one could focus on Asian America without reference to Asia. My instinct here is that because histories of migration give content to Asian American identity, we should then think broadly about the social, cultural, political, and economic relations between Asia and America. This trans-Pacific framing of Asian American identity makes sense of my own narrative as the son of immigrant parents born in China. In 1966, one year after the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, my father boarded an empty U.S. military cargo plane in Taipei, Taiwan, with 200 other graduate students headed to the U.S. This U.S. military cargo plane had finished resupplying U.S. troops in Vietnam fighting the Vietnam War, and its empty cargo hold could bring human resources to fuel the science and technology boom in the U.S. It was not uncommon for me to hear in the home of my upbringing, we came to America to have more opportunity for ourselves and for our families. This image of the U.S. military cargo plane is a metaphor for the transnational political and economic ties that help frame and explain Asian American identity. Yesterday was a very full day. Friends have been texting me and reaching out with their excitement for the conference. Some have asked me, are you tired? I might be a bit physically tired, but more than feeling tired, I feel energized. I'm energized by yesterday's presentations, panel discussions, workshop, moderated conversation, and fireside chat. I was even energized by the hour I spent in the lounge after the official end of the program. I'm energized by receiving direct messages from old friends I have not seen in many years. I'm energized through meeting new folks at the lounge tables. We have many friendly people attending this conference. I encourage you to sit at a table in the lounge and meet some new folks. Please introduce yourself. You can ask others at your table, what have you enjoyed so far? What stuck, what stuck to you the most during yesterday's program? I have found many warm and generous new friends at our lounge tables. I am also seeing new networks, groups, and partnerships in the making. I saw a discussion for a new reading group. We have denominational leaders here. We have organizational leaders here as well. We have editors who are soliciting submissions for publication. Please continue to check out our sponsors' exhibit booths to learn more about what they do. Please continue to stop by the lounge tables and meet new and old friends. So a word on the program and logistics. For those who are new and still figuring out AirMeet, I want to briefly review the logistics for our conference and some of the innovative features of AirMeet. AirMeet does everything that a Zoom session does. During the sessions, presenters will have 20 minutes to give their presentation, after which there will be 10 minutes of question and answer with the audience. People can ask their questions in the question and answer feed. Please upvote questions you like. The hosts will scan the questions and select questions for the presenter. Please note that we have a code of conduct. My co-host will place that code of conduct in the chat feed. Any harassing, intimidating, or discriminatory speech will not be tolerated. Now, AirMeet has significant advantages over Zoom when it comes to a virtual conferencing platform. And one of the differences you will notice through the tabs on the top of your screen is that you can move around in virtual space from the session to the lounge and to the booths area. 
Lastly, as I wrap up, I want to acknowledge and thank our sponsors, including Princeton Theological Seminary, the Overseas Ministry Study Center, the Presbyterian Mission Agency of the PCUSA, the Asian American Language Ministry Plan of the UMC, Pacific School of Religion, Asian American Christian Collaborative, Westminster John Knox Press, Whiptonstock Publishers, Erdman's Publishing, Rutgers University Press, Faith and Community Empowerment, and Inheritance Magazine. This conference would not have been possible without their financial and marketing support. Many of our sponsors have set up virtual exhibit booths. I encourage all attendees to enter the booth space and pop into those sponsor booths and chat with folks. Thank you for my thank you for listening to my opening remarks. I would invite Bonnie um, to come and introduce our first speaker. Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Bonnie Lynn, a PhD candidate in practical theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. And it is my honor to introduce Dr. Easton Law, the newly appointed Assistant Director of Academic Programs at the Overseas Ministry Center at Princeton Theological Seminary. Easton's PhD is in Theological and Religious Studies from Georgetown University. His research focuses on lived theology, public life, and religious pluralism in contemporary China. Previously, Easton taught intercultural relations at American University School of International Service in Washington, DC, and at Anhui Normal University in China. His presentation is titled, Living Faith Between Kingdoms and Empires, Pondering the Trans-Pacific Politics of Chinese slash American Theologizing. Welcome Easton. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to uh, everyone who's joining us um, from all over the world. It's uh, both an honor as well as uh, a little bit scary to be opening today's conference after such amazing presentations yesterday. But I think what was talked about yesterday bridges nicely with what we want to engage today. And I think David did a fantastic job uh, setting the stage. So without further ado, I am going to share my screen as is so common in these settings. And let's begin. Now as Christians, we confess to a living faith. And that of course means we want to live out our faith in the world as a testament to Christ's presence uh, at work in our lives and in the church and in the world. Now, from this perspective, for me, Asian American theology is simply an inquiry into understanding what God is doing in and through the Asian American experience. Now, that sounds pretty simple, but as we've heard yesterday, it really isn't because we are so much more than just our faith. We are histories and genealogies of place and people. We are embedded in social structures and hierarchical systems of race and trade. The gospel, of course, does have something to say to all of this, but how we live in this context is much more complex than anything than can be said. So a shout out to Reverend Sung Young and others yesterday afternoon and evening. Proclamation in action is harder than in word. So what do Asian American lives proclaim? This brings us to the question of lived theology. And again, David did a great job explaining this, so I won't belabor this point. But for me, lived theology means that it is a theology drawn first from our lived experiences. And this takes seriously the image of God within us, as well as the work of the spirit through us. And secondly, the insights of lived theology are meant to be lived. They're not meant to be thought about, believed, or confessed, but as actions in the world. And this takes seriously the missional call of the church in the world. Now, along with the rise in lived theology, there has been an ethnographic turn in theology. And there's a whole body of literature on this that um, I'm happy to talk to you offline uh, about. But as David explained, ethnography can be translated as understanding a people or understanding a culture through writing. It's based in participant observation and thick description. But more than ethnography, I want to highlight qualitative research as a whole. So whether it's in-depth interviews, oral histories, surveys, focus groups, discourse, and material analysis, 
all of this can be used for theologizing and not just sociology or history. If I could sum up ethnographic method and qualitative research, I would call it systematic listening. And if we're going to talk about using these methods in theology, it means not just systematic listening to the Bible or the history of the church, but systematic listening to the people of the church and a systematic listening to what God is doing through people's lives. Now, what then do Asian American lives proclaim? Well, one of the key traits of the Asian American experience has been liminality, which is a fancy word for saying stuck sort of in between, on the threshold between one world and another. Think, for example, when you leave, for me, as an Asian American growing up, one of those prime liminal spaces was walking out the front door of my house to school, leaving a house setting where we were speaking Chinese and just preparing myself unconsciously in that liminal space to walk into an American high school, for example. And of course, uh, Sang Hyun Lee of Princeton, uh, of, formerly of Princeton Theological Seminary, has written a book from a liminal place looking into this dimension of Asian American experience. Now that's important, liminality, that's the first point I want to make. But in fact, it's, it's still messier than that. It's messy, Asian American experience is more than that experience of in-between. Why, as we explored yesterday, Asian American is a very, very messy and complicated term. For them, and I mean those in power, those who are making the rules in the United States, Asian American was a racial category that was used to block, to segregate, and to control. And yet, come the 60s and 70s in the civil rights movement, as, we, as, as Dr. Hong explained for us so well, Asian American also became a social political category that was used to organize power. And if Asian American means these things, then there's an uncomfortable reality we have to engage if we're going to talk about Asian American theology. And that is that Asian American theology is not just about cultural experiences or discerning our heritage in between cultures. It is also about society and politics because that is the grounding of the term. And so I might revise what I said earlier. Asian American theology is an inquiry into understanding what God is doing in society, both politically and culturally through Asian American experience. And let's be honest, that's a little bit scary. Whenever you get into theology, society, and politics, things are bound to get scary. Why? Because theology is normative. It's supposed to be normative. It's not just about what happened or what's going on. It's about what ought to happen. And if we don't theologize carefully, we can end up with a lot of strange and sometimes scary things. This image here in point, a South Korean uh, American whose church in rural Pennsylvania has taken America's love for guns to a whole uh, another level of holiness. More on that uh, in discussion another time. And so in addition to liminality, I would like to add another dimension to Asian American life, and that is our contingency, our social political contingency, dependent or conditioned by something else. And in particular, I wanna talk about in, in this time, how we are social politically contingent to Asia, to the countries of our heritage, to what's going on there now, not just in the past. The COVID-19 pandemic has made this glaringly obvious. What happened in, what began in China has influenced Asian Americans across the United States and a rise in anti-Asian hate, regardless of whether one is Chinese or not. We are contingent. And if you notice on this image, Asians are not viruses, racism is. You'll also notice a little red flag up on top. That flag is the contingency in many of our lives at this point. It is the flag of the People's Republic of China. The person holding this sign must be in some way connected to that nation, which brings to me a special messiness, if you will. I am a scholar of Christianity in China. I am not a scholar of Asian America. 
I'm not a scholar of Asian American Christianity. I don't really know the literature, but I can tell you about these people on the screen and I can tell you about house churches in Shanghai much better than I can uh, anti-Asian hate protests uh, in the 1960s or 70s. And so the question this brings to me is the struggle with a trans-Pacific and transnational perspective to Asian American theology. What happens in Asia clearly throughout history has been, had a direct um, connection to what happens in the United States. What happens in the United States, a direct connection to what happens in Asia. And how do we theologize these connections is what I am struggling with. So this presentation is really an invitation to more mess. It's an invitation to ponder and theologize another layer of messiness in Asian American faith and life, the transnational or transpacific dimension that challenges us to not only consider what God is doing among and through the Asian diaspora in America, but also what God is doing in Asia and how we are connected both socially, politically, and spiritually to them. I'm gonna illustrate three main points that I think can push us toward thinking about a trans-Pacific lived theology of Asian American experience. One, an abductive posture toward the unfamiliar. And by abductive, it's a fancy term that simply means to be led or drawn away against one's will. And therefore, an abductive posture means an openness to being led away to some place that we may not want to go. Two, a critical impulse toward nationalism and empire. And three, a co-constructive sensibility that embraces our shared liminality and contingencies across boundaries. And what I mean by co-constructive is when we talk about Asian American theologizing into the future, I want to bring the stories of Asian America into conversation with church and society across nations, Asian theologies that are being worked out in China. For me, for you, it might be India or Pakistan, Korea, Myanmar. And so I'll illustrate these three points through my own personal experience, as well as a little bit from my research. I did my research initially in the setting of uh, the Yangtze River Delta, centered in Shanghai. And I wanted to ask the question, how were young Chinese urban professionals living out their faith? And this is not the time to go into the conclusions of that research, but I did notice something very important that among my pool of informants that I was interviewing and doing participant observation with, many of them would commonly reference their time outside of China. Again, these were, these were educated professionals, so they've studied in the United States. They've worked in the UK for a period of time. They, they've spent time in Australia, and now they, are, they were back in Shanghai doing work. And what that meant is living their faith in Shanghai was actually closely tied to how they lived their faith in the United States or the United Kingdoms. Those patterns of spiritual formation they developed in the Asian American church were having to be renegotiated once they were back in Shanghai. It was messy at times. Moreover, as I talked to a couple of other informants, several of them had their faith lives significantly shaped, reshaped when they were in Hong Kong a city that is, for me, uh, a liminal and contingent city par excellence, uh, especially today. And so to be drawn to someplace I did not anticipate, I shifted my research to Hong Kong. On July 1st, 2019, I uh, crossed the border from uh, Shenzhen into, into Hong Kong. I doubled the number of informants that I interviewed. Now, not with people from mainland China, but mainland Chinese in Hong Kong that are commonly known as Gong Piao or Hong Kong drifters, because as mainland Chinese, they were drifting in a space that wasn't quite China, but wasn't quite anywhere else either. Hong Kong, unique unto itself. And I want to illustrate uh, this, this trans-Pacific spiritual processing through, uh, through just a quote from one of my informants. Uh, this is just a, a stock image. This is not a real picture of him, but he's a family man. And he said, after traveling, working in the, in the UK as well, and now in Hong Kong. After moving so much with such different life experiences, I'm increasingly hesitant to talk about where I am from or belong. My wife and I obviously have sentiments for China. It is where we were born and raised, but now it is also so very unfamiliar. What's more important to us now is how to love others the way Christ calls us to. We are still trying to figure out what this means for our cultural identity. 
We want to keep the best of Chinese culture without falling prey to its weaknesses. Hong Kong may be a good place to work this out because it is a little bit of both. And he says, thinking about all this again makes me feel like as if I've moved farther and farther out into the world. My faith grew and grew with it. It makes me think that all this movement is part of God's plan after all. Leaving and starting again may be hard, but it also grows us in new places. The parts of my faith that didn't make sense before God connected. Looking back, what seemed like disappointment became blessing. And so that's the first point, living faith across boundaries. That we as Asian Americans need to be open to being drawn out. But what about me in this? This is a picture of me at my uh, online defense. Uh, that's sort of the way things work in an age of COVID. And at the very end, what, uh, one of my professors asked me, what is this? Do you think there's any kind of autobi autobiographical element to your research? And I'm thinking about it, absolutely true. I myself, as a Chinese American struggling, studying Chinese Christianity, what does Chinese Christianity mean for me as a Chinese American? currently living in Geneva, Switzerland. Switzerland is a place that is equally between empires. It is the seat of the United Nations. And it's really interesting to be here as a Chinese American because you get, although China and the United States are as far away as they can be geographically, they're also right in front of me. I was in the Palais des Nations once and the Human Rights Council was working. Um, and outside that council, People's Republic of China had set up an entire exhibit about human rights development in Xinjiang, the, process, the, the, the region in Western China that's currently experiencing a lot of controversy around whether or not China is uh, committing human rights atrocities. And they had all these great photos of uh, economic development and happy Uyghurs dancing and, and human rights journals that they had published. They were pushing something. Sitting down and in conversation with a church um, pastor, uh, the, the pastor of my church, right across, uh, right across from us in this cafe, uh, Singaporean and uh, American diplomats were discussing what it would mean to work together to try to keep the Chinese from trying to take another head seat in another UN organization. For me as a Chinese American, watching and hearing these things on the side, I felt both intimately entangled and yet completely far away from it. I felt contingent and liminal to these things that were happening because what's happening between China and the United States matters for what we, what, how we live and exist right now. And so this brings me to my second point, theologizing between empires, a critical impulse to nationalism and, and, and empire. When we think about theology, we have to work against the nationalistic impulses and even cultural belonging. Uh, and throughout that summer, Hong Kong was raging. I had bracketed a lot of the social political issues, but I really can't. Not if I want to do Asian American theology, right? And so I've been looking for examples of how to engage in a trans-Pacific and transnational perspective. And this essay published by E. Tammy Kim called Transnationally Asian in uh, about a year ago in the Columbia Journalism Review, was particularly transformative for me. She shared in this article 10, and especially 20 years ago, the Asian media I read and wrote for were Asian American, focused on people and events within the United States. The questions posed by magazines like Hyphen and Kriam concerned racial identity, assimilation versus acculturation, and representation in business and pop culture. Their stories tended to proclaim American belonging tinged with the inherent trans-Pacific trauma, Asia with it was a distant historical place, not a partner in dialogue. Its news and politics were not ours to wrangle with, nor did most of us have the linguistic tools to do so. But her article highlights an emerging voice in the media landscape uh, that's brought about by uh, pu online publishing magazines like New Bloom, based in Taiwan, Lao Sang Collective in Hong Kong, and New Narrative in Southeast Asia. And of these media outlets, she said, as the era of COVID-19 morphed into another sort of crisis, and a renewed Black Lives Matter movement went global, these outlets continued to provide guidance. Hong Kong activists relayed information on tear gas to protesters in Minneapolis, while Singaporeans debated the future of their colonial monuments, inspired by the toppling of sculpted genocidaires in Philadelphia and Bristol. People everywhere seemed to be taking up similar forms of self-determination, sovereignty without nationalism, 
humans before the state. And even in light of what's taken place in Atlanta, some of the articles that have come out, in the face of anti-Asian racism, Asians and Asian Americans need to better understand each other by Nathaniel Chen. Promise Lee recently wrote, fighting anti-Asian violence cannot include apologism for the Chinese state. In these media outlets, I found a trans-Pacific Asian voice. But then the question that I want to end with then is how do we articulate a trans-Pacific Asian Christian voice? And this is the, the final point I want to make about calling us in this next season of theologizing as a church, live theologizing, that we would have a co-constructive sensibility that works with the shared liminality and contingencies that all Asians and Asian Americans experience together. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the conversation that uh, to come. Ethan, thank you so much for, for that illuminating presentation. So at this time, we will have 10 minutes of Q&A, so please type and upvote your questions under the Q&A tab. So while people are, ta uh, are typing, Easton, I wanted to ask, so I think one of the struggles for Asian Americans is being viewed as a perpetual foreigner whose loyalties might lie somewhere other than America. So the temptation then is to downplay or neglect their trans-Pacific connections. Alternatively, others may be multiple generations removed from their ancestral home and don't want others to see their experiences filtered through the situation in Asia. So how might you respond to these kinds of concerns? Thanks for that question, Bonnie. And I, I myself struggled with this uh, question quite a bit. And I think that's why I, I wanted to highlight uh, contingent as one of the key experiences of Asian Americans today. Because the reality is whether one confesses or, or wants to be connected with Asia or not, it doesn't matter, you will be. It doesn't matter if, um, if you're a, a third generation Japanese American. When COVID breaks out in China and somebody starts talking about a China virus, they're gonna come for you whether you care about China, Asia or not. And so instead of ignoring these realities and trying to belong more and more and more, I think that's why I talked about being open to uh, having an abductive posture, okay? So much of Asian American uh, longing is to belong in America. But I think there's a theological point to be made here too, that instead of seeking that belonging as, as, as legitimate as it is, right, uh, in America, mm -hmm. that we need to embrace our liminality in such a way that we do not belong in America nor Asia. And, Owning that will help us to, I think, reimagine our faith and our action in the world, even as, 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 as Christians, so. Yes, as strangers and exiles. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Easton. I see that uh, one of the top voted questions in the Q&A is from Chris Morris in Canada. And he says, theology says followers of Jesus should be allergic to power. Historically, we have been eager to achieve it. Does the liminal experience make one more eager and make one more eager to grasp political power? Absolutely, yes, it does. Because I think it is human nature to say, if I don't like the state that I'm in, then I need the power to change that. And power in that sense isn't inherently wrong. We we heard from you know amazing activists in addition to scholars yesterday, right? The Asian American movement is about attaining power. But the question I think for Christians to consider is power for who? And I think honestly, as Christians, we do need to look to the example of Jesus Christ over and over. Also, a, you know, a person that was liminal, trapped between empires in many ways. Um, I think that to embrace our liminality um, will come with the temptations to seize power. But I think we need to theologically look to Jesus who did not seize that power and yet also fought to change things and to bring power to the powerless. Um, it's a very fine line to draw. And uh, throughout history, we see people um, that were once oppressed become oppressors. It's not unusual at all. Mm, and I think uh, right. Christians need to be a testament to, to against that. And of course, that's very difficult. Right, upside down values of the kingdom. So Kalani Padilla 
from Whitworth University asks, uh, oh, once. in terms of qualitative research, you have focalized memoir. Can you talk about any literary or creative works, novels, poetry, or other memoirs that may have influenced or been part of your ethnographic research? Thank you. Um, I should say, uh, I, I didn't mention it due to time, but I am only just now pondering what autoethnography might mean for theologizing. And I would never have taken this turn without the invitation to speak here, because obviously I've just focused on Christianity in China. And I've, all, I've, I've written about that by and large from the perspective of I'm a scholar looking at Chinese Christianity, not I am a Chinese American with actual lineage connections to this place that I'm not. And But once I had to think about that, the autobiographical, the memoir uh, becomes uh, a, a, a factor here. I would say one piece that influenced me quite a bit was uh, this book called Shanghai Faithful by Jennifer Lin, which traces three generations of, of, of uh, Chinese uh, Christians in Shanghai. And, if, and, and there's, there's a bunch of this genre of books of three generations of Chinese, uh, you know, because the things have changed so quickly in China. Um, but this one, because it was Christian, struck me a certain way, and it made me think about my family. David shared about his family a little bit in the intro. I think memoir is so important to that co-constructive element. Um, I think for, for everyone in the audience, regardless of how many generations you are in the United States, learn about your history of how you got here, even if it's five generations ago, because that'll just create, you know, write your own memoir, if you will. Uh, it's going to create that link that makes you think about things a little more deeply. It did for me, um, and it's something I will continue to try to, to try to move forward. So. Yeah, thank you, Easton. Okay, so maybe one quick question from Christopher. We have heard at least of two different definitions for theology, namely whether church or God in society is the subject under study. So could we hear more about the distinction and nuance? Are those distinctions already blurred? Very, the very quick answer to that is yes. <laughs> yes, they are very, very blurred. And that's why I think lived theology work um, is, it has to be done in community, I think, which is what conferences like this are for, um, because theology has often been sort of this endeavor where uh, a theologian can think through scripture and history. But when you're talking about life as it's lived, embedded in, in social hierarchies and, and all these kinds of things, there's there's tons of blinders. Our positionality, get, you know, like our, you know, talk about intersectionality. We have so many blinders on. There's no way to do live theologizing the other than as a group. And the academy is also not a big fan of group work for some reason, unless you're doing lab work. <laughs> um, and so we need to adopt that lab work mentality, quite frankly, where articles are published by six people. <laughs> Um, with different eyes on on the different angles. Um, and, and and that seemed kind of roundabout, but it's a, it is an answer to the question. Um, the fact that, that the fact that they are so blurred takes multiple eyes to do live theology well because uh, society and, and 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 religion are so intermeshed um, in ways, uh, you know, I was very much struck by comments yesterday that you know religion and and you know society have under modern, terms split down the middle, but they've never been split. We've only imagined them to be split. And that messy blurring requires a, a, a new perspective. So. Thank you so much, Easton. So remember, you can ask Easton more questions at our pan panel later this morning. And so now please join us for our next session starting at 10. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Happy to chat with people. Um, you can direct message me as well if you have a question. So.